Okay, I think now this is working. So uh, first of all, uh, hi everyone, and thanks for joining this public talk uh, at Gasworks with Gala Porraskim and John Taylor. Uh, my name is Sabel Gabaldon. I'm uh, the creator at Gasworks. And first of all, I wanted to say thanks so, so much, both John Taylor and Gala for being here tonight. I know Gala is at the moment in the US, in St. Louis, installing an exhibition that actually opens tomorrow. So amazing that you found the time and the energy to do this. And similarly, John, who is a very busy uh, uh, curator and scholar, also is recovering uh, uh, from COVID at the moment. So thanks so much, John, for finding the energy to be here tonight and uh, be in conversation with Gala. I really, really, really appreciate for both of you to be here. And this is a very nice opportunity to actually host a conversation, which is part of Gala's work itself. We'll talk a little bit about what Gala's work in general terms and for this exhibition has consisted of. And also what does the job of a British Museum curator in the case of John Taylor entail? And what's the conversation that kind of happens here? Before we go into this, I will just briefly introduce you. Uh, John Taylor is a curator at the Department of Egypt and Sudan at the British Museum. His uh, field of expertise focuses on uh, funerary objects uh, of the pharaonic period, especially uh, mummies and coffins. He has created a number of exhibitions at the British Museum, including Journey Through the Afterlife, uh, the Ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead in 2010, and Ancient Lives, New Discoveries in 2014. And Gala Poraskim is our current exhibiting artist. Her exhibition is about to finish, uh, sadly. This is our last weekend, actually. She was born in Bogota and is based in Los Angeles. Her work has been featured internationally at uh, biennials, including in Sao Paulo, Wenju, uh, the Winnie Biennial as well. She's also been working alongside and responding to collections and museums, including LACMA, uh, including the National Museum in Wenju. She's been a research fellow uh, at Harvard and is currently an artist in residence at the Getty. And that's also an important side of Kalak's practice, this conversation with institutions, with collecting institutions. And that's actually what brings us here today. The exhibition at Gadworks has been an amazing opportunity, I think, to uh, bring Gala to London. Also, thanks to our partnership with Alfina Foundation, which basically allowed for Gala to be during the spring over a couple of months, actually, in London, doing research on the British Museum, and then come back uh, to produce the work. Most of the work at Gasworks is kind of newly commissioned and produced here, responding to this specific context. And for us, it felt very, very open, very important that those conversations and those questions that Gallup or Schemes work opens as our works were also shared with the audience and shared with institutions, in this case, the British Museum. And specifically, we reach out to John Taylor and we couldn't be more grateful that you, uh, John, uh, um, accepted the invitation to be here tonight and share some of these questions, concerns that are present in both your work as a curator and Gala's work as an artist, and basically share them with the audience tonight. And those questions, some of you may have seen the show, relate to the afterlife of uh, cultural objects institutions, relate to the ethics of museum conservation, to the question of human remains and how how do we take care of them? And hopefully tonight we'll get kind of some further insight on, on all of those questions. I think maybe a good way to start the conversation, uh, Gala and John, would be to talk a tiny bit about your practice and what does it entail so that the audience gets a sense of what brings us here and what's the background of this exhibition and your work as a curator, John. Maybe Gala, would you like to start? Yeah, hi. Um... Thanks, of course, to Sabel and John for being here. And um, I guess um, if people didn't see the exhibition at Gasworks, I think that many of my works have to uh, deal with uh, questions of how material lives within institutions and how you know history is basically framed through the way that material is either conserved or registered or uh, framed within a collection and how it might have been existing before it entered it, et cetera. So that's, it's just how contingent that material is on different people who interact with it after its original function historically. And so of course, as part of that um, bigger theme, uh, the exhibition at Gasworks was uh, focusing on the collection of the British Museum that 
by default um, is a lot about Egypt. And so um, I uh, sort of focused it around the idea of living things within the museum, whether those are, uh, you know, mold or spiritual life or other things. And, um, you know, in my work, I, of course, collaborate and talk to a lot of people who work and deal with those materials firsthand. And so I am very happy that John is here to firsthand uh, sort of show part of the, you know, my process and conversations that are already existing within uh, institutions all over the world. Okay, thank you, Gala. Um, I'll follow that up with a, a brief summary of, of my approach to the, the collection in the, in the British Museum as a curator. Um, the Egyptian collection is a very large one, uh, about 100,000 objects in total. And of course, only a small proportion of that can be on display at any one time. And my main role as a curator, of course, is to care for these objects and for the human remains to help to preserve them for the future um, and to create the displays. So that involves a lot of very detailed in-depth investigation of the object in order to make a selection from them, which is what the public will see in the galleries. Now, of course, we try to give access to the whole collection uh, through an online database, through traveling exhibitions, um, but it's the, the permanent galleries, of course, that are what the public mainly see. That is the interface they have with the Egyptian collection. Um, and as curators, of course, we are always looking for ways to, to maximize the potential of this collection. How do we convey the maximum information about the ancient past through these objects? Um, obviously, by the, the process of selection, we tend to focus on certain types of objects, the ones which are most complete, visually most striking, um, the ones which are most durable, better preserved, um, but there are always elements which we can't really convey effectively through museum displays. And I think this is why your exhibition is so interesting because you're focusing on aspects of the collection that we as curators don't really get to engage with um, in a way that is so meaningful. Lots of questions about what these objects actually meant to the ancient Egyptians, how they thought they would function for eternity. And can we in some way reflect that in the way that we play them? So these are the kind of things that um, are coming through from your exhibition. And I think there's a lot of scope for discussion around those themes. Yeah, I, I think that one of the, um, you know, I've worked a lot with multiple, institutions that have different bodies within them. But what I thought was specifically interesting about uh, the Egyptian mummies was that I always try to go in and just see what, as you said, is uh, focusing on the subsection of artifacts or objects or material that was supposed to do a specific function indefinitely, whether it's like a body part or like things that go to the grave or ritual things with spiritual life, something that was never ending. And so in a sense, just putting, you know, seeing the, the collection through that frame of mind and looking at the Egyptian one. And what was interesting about, like I said, the specifics of the, uh, the, your, your room was that, uh, you know, the ideas of conservation really aligned with the past plan of the ancient Egyptian because they wanted their body to be so well preserved, whereas other bodies in other countries, et cetera, were supposed to decay or like people are thinking that they're going to be buried and the material bits will just disappear. The mummies were like really supposed to be well preserved. And so the mission of conservation actually aligns really well with that past plan. And so uh, what I wanted to sort of talk to you about or what you thought was like in the process of thinking through these objects, like how would you, um, how would the museum with the, with the, with all of its like methodology and like regulation and specificity about how things are supposed to exist within it 
um, can account for some other agency of a of an ancient person who actually believed that they would still be around some in some capacity. And since we can't actually prove that that doesn't happen, mm -hmm. then what it, like in that space of the what if it actually does work because they were so certain of it, no? And so like you having to deal with like actual people, do you go through it and like, because, you know, as part of the work at Gasworks, there is a letter directly to you about thinking about uh, how would you curate for another type of audience that it's like the people in the actual display, no? Yes, I think this is really fascinating um, because we, we're in this fortunate position of the ancient Egyptians being with us in the museum, mm -hmm. um, you know, which raises all kinds of interesting possibilities. Um, and one way I think that we can try to approach what you're describing there is to reconstruct the context of all of these objects in the tombs as far as possible. Um, and that's what we've tried to do, actually, in our galleries, to, to bring back together assemblages of objects from individual tombs and graves. You know, the old, a more old-fashioned way of displaying these things in the museum was in a kind of taxonomic sense, where, you know, all the coffins were in one place and all the canopic jars in another, and you trace the evolution of each of object. But no point where the contemporaneous objects brought back together so you saw how they actually worked in the terms of the ancient burial environment that's what we've tried to do in our displays now um, obviously we can't be totally successful there one of the ways for example in which we would like to be able to go a step further is something that you've done in your exhibition and this relates to orientating objects on the points of the compass uh, and in ancient Egypt, this was tremendously important. Yes. The path of the sun, you know, mm. from east to west was an enormously important access, axis uh, for the ancient Egyptian. Right. All of their burial practices relate to that. In the tomb, the coffin was meant to be positioned with one side facing east. So the dead person looked towards the rising sun. This is what you've shown in your exhibition, of course, by mm. positioning a replica sarcophagus on that alignment. In the museum, of course, we weren't able to do that. We actually had the sarcophagus on the wrong alignment. But that doesn't mean that we, we weren't aware of this, of course. You know, I think as curators, we're always thinking about these issues. Mm -hmm. We would love to be able to find compromise solutions which enable you to kind of reflect the ancient uh, intention within a modern display. Mm -hmm. um, and you, of course, is on us as curators are the shortage of space in that regard to, to create flow through galleries. Mm, sorry, interjected there. In that regard, I think something that is very challenging to me about Gala's exhibition and the sort of questions it poses is that I think your work gala in relation to a British Museum, what is typically a very pragmatic question around display and how do we build narratives on display, as you were saying, John. Display museums is a way to tell a story through objects, but the very pragmatic question about display suddenly turns into a very philosophical one, which is what does it mean for somebody to become something? What does it happen when a subject becomes an object, a cultural artifact? And the challenging question is also, <coughs> we are able to return some of that subjectivity to these people within the context of a museum, which is something that very early on in our uh, uh, chats that I remember when you were starting to think about this project, an idea that came to mind as a kind of reference point is how people like, say, Donna Haraway, where they have thought, for example, about the life of animals in laboratories, say mice. And someone like Donna Haraway, when she thinks about the mice in labs, one thing that I find very challenging about her ideas is the fact that she admits that very, very, very possibly we need mice as a laboratory animal, as an experimental animal for the survival of the species. But then the question for her becomes, how do we make their agency and their subjectivity better? How do we provide a better well-being for those animals within a laboratory setting? And similarly, I think one of the questions we're posing as Gala is how do we make room within the museum for sort, some sort of kind of different understanding of, of these objects, isn't it? Well, I was just thinking in terms of like, even with the sarcophagus itself, I was wondering why, what would be the museum regulation that doesn't allow for 
the sarcophagus to be and I was like oh maybe it's because it will like obstruct the flow of I don't know and so I was thinking it was more like <laughs> when I saw the sarcophagus it was like if you rotate it then it would block the pathway somewhat but I, th I thought that in a way it was like, what were the actual existing things that would prevent some of the things to happen? Or even, and, and, and not necessarily they have to be so dramatic if that's like a specific thing, but in a way, if like the time, for example, when the museum exists and it's close to the public, if you could then curate for um, the people who are in the, you know, the mummies or whatever, no? Because I was thinking like, oh, if you just put yourself in the position of that ancient person and you in theory are now in this body that is in the museum, then of course there has to be a compromise where it's like the, the fee for, for the museum conserving and maintaining your physical body is that you have to be on display to teach people about ancient Egypt or whatever, then uh, somehow like that, uh, line would move more towards the middle and not so much in the like the the current day side benefit no yeah i think what you're saying about the uh positioning of objects like the sarcophagus yes the, the practicalities are are often the the boring but uh essential thing that that dictates that um in, in our upper galleries upper egyptian galleries where we have lots of egyptian coffins and mummies uh, when we planned those, the original idea was that we might be able to position some things in the original orientation, but mm -hmm. because of the layout of the galleries, they would all finish up blocking the central aisle, as you say. Um, so we, we are simply forced by that practical issue not to do it in that way. Um, your, your, your question about restoring agency to the ancient Egyptians, you know, and actually curating for them is, is really interesting, I think. Um, I mean, one thing, of course, that they wanted was that their names should be pronounced still. Um, wow. Now, we don't have a means of doing this. Um, as a way that their names would be pronounced how? Well, um, if, the, if the name of an ancient Egyptian was still spoken years after they died, this was uh, conceived as a way of keeping them alive. Oh, we can have like a list so, of it just playing. <laughs> there could be, yeah, you could you could have a kind of recitation. Like roll name. call every morning, like a roll call. But it's funny oh. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> present. <laughs> it's interesting how that same concern stays in many cultures. Think of within a Catholic setting, people paying for masses to be done in their names in the afterlife, or like the idea that one's name will be repeated for the afterlife, like it's quite current, actually. It's still there in many places. Yeah, it, it's very, very, very strong for the ancient Egyptians, certainly. Um, and, of course, if we're giving tours in the galleries, we will mention the names of these mummies if we know who they are. Uh, so visitors do hear those names. Obviously, the way we pronounce them is probably not the way they sounded originally. <clears throat> but it's something that we're conscious of, certainly, yeah. Oh my goodness, that would be so good if we have a list and then, but it could also just be somehow like, that's what I, I think that the, my interest is, is like how not to get in the actual day-to-day -day running of the museum, but to actually uh, somehow, even as a gesture, uh, do something that the, that ancient audience might want. So for example, now that you mentioned this role, this like, saying out loud, it would be just like making a track of their name and just like calling it out before the museum opens every day or something. Be like, you guys, we're all coming to work and now we're gonna work on teaching people about ancient Egypt and then that's it. And so it's kind of like checking in through your job. <laughs> it's a very cost-effective way as well. I think, you know, with the curator on duty every week can do that. So yeah, I think it's a good one, that. And another point, of course, is that they wanted to have offerings made to their spirits every right. day, food and drink. Um, in the actual tomb, they would bring real food and drink. Um, in one of our galleries, we, we have some dried ancient loaves of bread in front of a, a statue, uh, which is a kind of gesture towards that. 
you can put the cafeteria in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Somehow in the day to day, I just think that in a way uh, that this, the, the idea of ancient Egyptians doesn't then stops being so ancient because in a way it's like bringing their uh, temporality to current day times you know if they thought that they were not gonna that life was not gonna actually end and it would just be a different shape then somehow we're also participating with it not necessarily in like a you know we're living here and then they are stuck in the past that doesn't exist anymore but somehow how do we in our daily life can also um, interact with them not necessarily in like a uh, staged way where it's like I'm an audience and it's an object but like more like they also want something from us no yes I, I think we are we're doing that with with the ancient Egyptians in a way that is not happening for other ancient cultures you know because... but I think it's because we have so much record of what they wanted that's why it was so that was so because one of the things that I realized while working through this is the idea of like uh, the afterlife um, and how if somebody in ancient times actually planned for it and left a lot of directions, then they are actually living not necessarily in a way of how you might think an afterlife person might live, but like through, you know, the way that you're thinking about it or that, you know, even in my case, how I could not avoid you know, working with that specific uh, culture, because for in my, if I, if it was up to me, I must, must have, uh, would have rather like pick something more subtle, but it was so big. And like, they're basically, you walk in the room and it's like, we're still here. <laughs> yeah. They've left more instructions for this than any other ancient people. Yeah. Um, you know, and one thing that comes across strongly is that as well as all the objects they place in the tomb, the rituals that were performed uh, and the sound of those rituals was absolutely critical. So they place enormous importance on pronouncing the words of ritual and, and spell. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the speaking of those things that is the, the most powerful way of making them effective. Um, so again, in your exhibition, of course, you, you have the, the vocalization of the words on an Egyptian stealer uh, and, and this is absolutely what they would have wanted. They wanted those words to be spoken aloud. Yeah, I think that that was, um, you know, when we were thinking it, when I saw the Stella for the first time, you know, you go up this like staircase and right before you enter like the, the room with a lot of the, the afterlife, uh, Egyptian afterlife, there's the Stella for the public and it's a Horan Suti Stella that has like a, basically lyrics of the song. And so when I saw it, I was like, I really just want to hear what it's like. Um, and so we, um, uh, Sabel and Gasworks uh, basically commissioned this e Egyptologist, Heidi Kopp, to produce a interpretation of what the sound might have uh, been like, no? And so the idea of like the stone just being uh, uh, like a, not necessarily the object itself because the sound is the actual work or something like that. No, like when you're thinking about music or something like the score becomes secondary and then it's the actual sound that is the primary uh, thing that you have to see, no? I think that the thing as well in that sense is, I think we, we discovered through the process of working with Heidi, how similar in a way your practices were and Heidi being a person that has a very different kind of research background to you, being like an Egyptologist who is also uh, an experimental anthropologist, uh, kind of someone that also devotes part of her life to music and has tried to find ways to revive something that is mostly lost. The melodies are lost. The pronunciation, as John uh, was saying, is like highly speculative. It's like a, a consensus among uh, uh, academics, isn't it, about how how we think those words may have been pronounced, even though we have no proof. And in the end, something that came out of those conversations is how high this practice is like this sum of data research uh, collected from inscriptions, depictions, and so forth. But then this vast ocean of speculation, really, which is something that also happens in your practice. And I wonder, John, to what extent, in relation to those very questions that you were posing about the work of a curator creating that narrative, 
and paying testament to those lives and those objects, what's the role that speculation and imagination plays in something that from afar looks like kind of dry and academic for many, but actually assume there's so much that one cannot know that. Yeah, well, I, I think we're in a fortunate position because, you know, as we were just saying, the Egyptians left such a lot of the written record that the level of speculation um, is, is not quite so pronounced as in some other ancient cultures. Um, and what we're lacking is, yes, the sound of the actual words, the sounds of, for example, music. There must have been a lot of music accompanying all of these rituals. <clears throat> we don't know much about that. Um, but I think another interesting point here, which this is kind of leading into, is this whole question of the eternalizing of these rituals. Um, and Gala was mentioning earlier this idea that we believe the Egyptians thought that once the ritual process had started, it would go on eternally. Do we actually know that? Um, <clears throat> was, it in, was it possible, perhaps, that these ritual processes could be stopped? And these objects that we regard as containing the essence of individuals could they somehow be de deactivated, closed down? Um, and this is a, quite interesting because there is evidence that that could happen in ancient Egypt. Uh, sorry, I'm just rehydrating myself. <coughs> so we know, for example, that statues were regarded as kind of uh, recipients for the spirit. Statues were placed in tombs and temples, but over, <coughs> over many centuries, the number of statues became so huge that the temples would have to take them away. Um, there was simply no more room for statues in the colonnades and, and the halls. So what do they do with them? They don't take them out of the temples. They dig big pits below the temple floors and they bury the statues there. And we think the reason is <coughs> that the statues have become, um, they have the essence of divinity. They're dedicated within the God's house and <coughs> they contain the essence of these individuals. And therefore, you cannot simply dispose of them or throw them away. You have to somehow decommission them. <coughs> And by burying the, the sacred compound, you're doing this in a kind of if way. You're, you're leaving them within the protection of the god. You are kind of putting them to sleep. Mm. Um, so you, you, you have to that... wonder whether this is happening with some of the objects which we're now looking after in the museum. He, with some of the conversations that I had with other archaeologists, they, uh, I think there was a story where somebody dug up a, a ritual site where it was supposed to be, they had like a, a bowl that contained, that was supposed to be containing water and food indefinitely. And of course, when they dug it up, it was one of the first instances where they actually replaced it and put a modern day bowl so that the function of whatever this ancient bowl might be do, might have done in the past would still be possible without that specific object. So somehow, to be able to like still find a way that these like functionalities might happen for an ancient person that might not necessarily be so like specifically attached to that bowl, et cetera. And so then in a way, um, then uh, even within the display of the museum, I was thinking like whatever the function of these material, uh, somehow it is still possible that it might still be doing this uh, because, you know, maybe the positioning was not so it could be relevant, but like if you have to compromise, then you'd be like, yeah, it's not arranged perfectly, but at least I can still uh, do something with it. But um, in this idea of the, the, the thing that you brought up, John, with um, uh, the people coming back into objects. Uh, you know, what, what was interesting to me uh, was thinking about, I think I read that you were like an archaeobiologist or something like that. And it was the first time that I had heard of term at all, like archaeobiology, where it was like the, 
was it on the website? Somewhere I read about it that it was like people who deal with ancient bodies or something, no? And so then I was thinking about this idea of like biology in the ancient times and how uh, if, if the uh, people in ancient Egypt thought that they would be reincarnated into granite sculpture, then that granite sculpture would become an extension of biology because now it is becoming an actual part of a body, no? And what would that mean in terms of like a person who's uh, looking at, you know, scientific like meat body parts to have to now uh, include granite as a part of, you know, biological matter because now it contains the spirit or whatever uh, of that, you know, because I'm thinking like in Egyptian science or biology, then granite obviously is part of the body, no? as an extension or receipt, res, res, receptacle? Receptacle. Receptacle. So it goes back to the very philosophical question that I think your work poses, and I was mentioning at the beginning of what happens in that kind of channeling or, or kind of transition in between the somebody and the something being a subject or an object, and suddenly looking at these funerary statues, and there's specific drawing in the show by Gala that responds to one of these funerary statues in that way looking at this object almost like some sort of cyborg or prosthetic like a technology that carries someone really rather than just being like cold stone but it'd be brilliant yeah. to know it just look it just reminds me of you know that idea of like people now who are trying to like uh freeze their brain for a future like transplant <laughs> into uh another thing like you know cryogenic freeze or something and then i was thinking like oh people in ancient egypt already did that with those granite things but they're like oh if i'm thinking about conservation and preservation of my physical body that is going to decay too quickly so i need the upgraded version which is granite and that's going to last so much better so how do we like move from our meat body into like the granite body i don't know how that technology works or like um mechanics of it but in a way if it might have happened which some of them did believe that no and so then i think then kefka was the guy and um and then i was thinking like oh now they're on view and i was thinking like they're basically employees of the museum you know somehow unpaid employees because they have to be there for the display you know like kind of performers without actually like having a credit line <laughs> or something <laughs> i think a way of looking at it is that they imagine that they their, the spirit part of the person could inhabit a whole range of forms simultaneously. So oh. the primary one is the actual body. Okay. In the <coughs> and then all of these statues and other objects, they could inhabit those at the same time. Um, I, I'm not sure that you can go so far as to suppose that <clears throat> the stone becomes a kind of biological extension of the person. Um, it's a physical um, substitute, but not perhaps part of the living organism necessarily. But then we, we don't really know how they imagine. So what do you What would, I mean, something that I don't know is like how, you know, I'm thinking about like, did they think of death as like, another part of life like where it's like you go from a toddler to a kid to a teenager to a like an elder person to a dead person but that's just like same part of the you know there's certainly a kind of progression going on yes yeah so they see life in that way um but when you get to the point of death i think then you can divide up into multiple um entities almost <coughs> inhabiting these different forms made of different materials um, and of course another interesting aspect is the transference the possibility of transferring ownership of some of these stone and wooden objects as we know that things like coffins and statues would be reused reassigned to other individuals um, <coughs> And one way of doing this is simply to inscribe a new name on the object. Here we come back again to this idea of the name enshrining the individuality of a person. If you have a statue made for yourself, someone else comes along, scrapes your name off and puts their name on, and it becomes their statue, and it becomes a receptacle for their spirit. 
So they were less of a cyborg and more of an Airbnb, some sort of. Yeah, it's like a spiritual Airbnb. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a very neat illusion. Yeah, I'd never thought of that before. But yeah, something like that. Oh my goodness, that is like basically you would have to like request uh, in case your name gets scraped off, you would hedge your bets and scrape it on like as many objects as possible just in case. Mm. But it's it's interesting because something that fascinates me about the work that both of you do actually is that there is this very, very tricky, challenging exercise of trying to kind of put together what people in the past may have thought, kind of felt or did, which is often so kind of lost to us really. And it's funny when we were speaking about thinking of this statue, like some sort of cyborg or biological extension of one's body. In the end, it may be the case that we're kind of determined by a very kind of Christian way of looking at the more, at, 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 at kind of that reality in which basically the afterlife basically implies some sort of reviving in the flesh. It's like a very, very Western uh, 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 um, kind of modern slash contemporary way of looking at things. But when John's saying, which is that these objects could be some sort of portals allowing for different spirits in different moments to come in, feels like so removed from us and so difficult to kind of conceive. But I also think that that makes for such an interesting exhibition. Like somehow if I knew that like the sculpture that actual physical material was interchangeable or something or like the then in a way you would feel like so many spirits rolling through that gallery you know mm -hmm. um yeah and i think also it's interesting that in the process of mummification what's happening is that some parts of the body are being taken away and disposed of and they're being replaced with other materials, which are not actually part of human anatomy at all, you know, like resin and incense and sometimes sand and mud and a whole range of materials, which can in some way support, uh, an Egyptian belief, support life. So, you know, they're, they're actually forming a new, a new kind of body. Yeah, but that's like such a... That's what I thought that it was like somehow they have like wrapped it up that this other materials become part of biology. And so I was thinking because, you know, as like a, uh, you know, as an artist, you're like dealing with the other materials that they're using like resin or granite or whatever. I was like, oh my goodness, like would an ancient artist or the person who carved that granite work be like a doctor or something? Like what would, you know, who, what type of role did the person who was carving that granite sculpture be called? Like a uh, doctor for the after, like doula of person who was going to become living in this thing after? Like they, not necessarily that they're stuck in the like sculpture uh, artist uh, label, but they would be more in the doctor. The, the, there is an analogy, yeah. One of the words in ancient Egyptian for a sculptor is si ankh, which means literally one who causes to live. So one what? A, one who makes something to live. Oh. So a sculptor is a is a person who is bringing life to something. Like animating matter. <laughs> the idea of uh, the sculpture animating matter. Huh. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what what he's doing. Yes, I think the doula of the afterlife are you uh, is, is you, Gala, <laughs> in this exhibition at least. <laughs> no way. Thinking about how to kind of provide a different passage to these people or a different way of kind of. Yeah, that's been done already. Like somebody did that already. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's interesting because that. That kind of uh, question from Gal and that comment brings us back to this idea of how uh, museums, I mean, if that happens even for a kind of small number of things like works, I imagine it's the, it's the case kind of uh, much more obviously for a museum like the British Museum, there's so many kind of agendas and constituencies. And we think about different forms, of, different types of audience, we think about funders, we think about, in the case of the British Museum, uh, an academic kind of uh, network as well. But suddenly these questions from Gala in her show brings us to the idea of what if one of the main constituencies 
is actually these people and 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 where could kind of at for where how could creating evolve by being in dialogue with these very people and what what forms it may take in the space yeah that's a big question um i think one thing to say is you you mentioned earlier about this kind of how a human body becomes a cultural artifact um that's one thing that is always in the back of our minds as curators um we are very concerned to present these bodies as human remains not object we're careful not to refer to mummies or human remains as object um even though they may have become partially um objectified in the sense that they are partly composed of non-biological material um, when they've been mummified. Um, I think, you know, the, the way that we want to look in the future is to pursue this humanization or rehumanization of, of the mummies and the bodies in the collection, you know, to, to try to come back closer, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> closer to that um, to the connection, you know, that we all have uh, as, as humans ourselves, uh, to, to share the common commonality of, of being human with these people from the remote past. I think this is a very... I think that um, in a way, you know, the ob the, that material mass uh, is both. You know, it's, it is, of course, a historical object, but it also is a person. So in a way, it's mostly thinking about how those multiple functions of this specific thing, whether uh, how the priority of the display highlights one over the other, because in a way, like you can't pick one or the other, they are both always there, you know, it's always going to be a person and it's always going to be a historical logic because it is, you know, so in a way, it's not necessarily that you can like decide that one is, uh, whether one is one black and white now is a historical object or now it becomes a mummy, like it's always both. So in a way, something about the display and the labels really uh, shows the, um, the position of the institution that is displaying it because like subtle gestures actually uh, say, you know, even allude to the fact that that other historical past as an ancient person might still exist, no? Mm. Um, but yeah, that's it. I think that one of the easiest ways is to be like, how if you got a freshly dead person, how would you treat it? <laughs> I think this is a very kind of good note, maybe to start wrapping up. Something I forgot to mention in the beginning to uh, the viewers uh, of this live stream is that there's a comment section on YouTube. So uh, please feel free to drop your questions and maybe we could uh, wrap up the session with a little bit of a QA. and a if there's questions from the audience. I'm going to check whether anyone is writing here. This is actually the first time we live stream directly on YouTube. So it's kind of new for us, but hopefully uh, the question section is working. Yeah, I can see no questions at the moment. Stunned. <laughs> While you're doing that, I'm going to grab some more water. I'm back in a moment. How does the, the YouTube thing work? Like, is there still an ongoing chat and stuff? Or? I think so. I think the question should hopefully be working. We we actually don't have questions at the moment. So maybe it's a good point to actually, and I couldn't be too kind of more grateful to both of you and for the audience uh, here tonight. And if you haven't uh, had the chance to visit the exhibition, uh, please do. We're closing on Sunday. So this is really our last opportunity. Please do. We're closing on Sunday. So this is really our last opportunity. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.